Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, if you uh, were paying attention, if you've been attending these Wednesday night Bible studies, you know that we normally start at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and that is to accommodate Sister Renee's schedule so she can get home from her church and, and be here with us. Uh, tonight, uh, unfortunately, Sister Renee has had an accident. She tried to do her own plumbing repair and hurt herself, and she's in a lot of pain, so we need everybody to pray for her, but that also it means she's not with us tonight. So um, fortunately, we do have uh, Brother Cripps, and also I invited Brother uh, Steve, a soldier for Christ. We are at war, and he's with us also. And uh, they've agreed to uh, do something uh, tonight that's quite different. Uh, and uh, we've been discussing this before we started the show, so they're not caught off guard while I'm trying to, um, the message I want everybody to get tonight. Uh, but before we get started with this, um, let me ask uh, Brother Steve, uh, say hi, introduce yourself to the viewers. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve. I uh, obviously heard my channel name, Soldier for Christ. We are at war. Um, you can check me out. I have still only have one video. Um, uh, I want to do more, but, uh, you know, uh, if God wills to give me the time to do that, I will. Um, but uh, if you want to check my video out on the gospel, that'd be great. It's great to be here, and thank you, Brother Luke, for having me on the show. All right, very good. It's nice to be have you uh, part of the discussion again. And uh, Brother Cripps, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Yes, my name is Jason Cripps, and uh, my channel, our channel, I should say, is TSL, which is True Story Live. comes on Sunday night at 9. Um, probably a lot of you have been over there, and I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm also happy that Steve's here. I'm sorry that uh, Renee can't be here tonight, and I'll be praying for her. And I hope everyone in the chat room does that as well. Prayer does work, so make sure and keep that up. Um, thank you, Brother Luke, for having me be a part of the uh, broadcast as usual, and I'm looking forward to tonight. All right, very good. Um, well, if if you've been um, watching and uh, involved in our Wednesday night studies now, you know that we started off uh, reviewing famous sermons. We did uh, Spurgeon's sermon, Warrant of Faith, and we gave it an A++. We loved it. And then we reviewed uh, Jonathan Edwards' sermon, um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and we hated every minute of it. And the same thing, Paul Washer's sermon, uh, Examine Yourself. Um, but last week we began a journey that I'm really very, very excited about. I think it's going to take us a year or two or three. And uh, Renee and I, we decided we wanted to work our way through the Pauline epistles. And we're going to go through it one verse at a time. Last week we did the introduction. So you, uh, you have the, the, the groundwork laid. Uh, who wrote it? When was it written? Who was it written to? What's the main point it wants to make? And so on. And, uh, and then we got through the first seven verses. Um, so I, I hope you will watch it from the beginning. Go back and watch the first video when you get a chance and get yourself caught up here. But tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read the next um, verses 8 through 13. Just read them. And then we're going to begin a play. And uh, it may sound crazy, but let me tell you what we want to accomplish here. Um, I have a playlist in my channel titled, uh, Was Paul a Diatribalist? Prosopopoeia. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll go watch that. It goes into much greater detail uh, about this idea of prosopopoeia, but tonight we're going to demonstrate what I mean by prosopopoeia. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, he's a thespian. Not lesbian, he's a thespian, right? Well, I am a lesbian trapped inside a man's body. Uh, yeah, I've heard about those people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm 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 straight up uh uh straight up straight. <laughs> I know. It's, our, it's our attempt at humor, right? Hey, it's humorous. <laughs> so it's, it's I thought about saying that, but I wasn't sure that was appropriate, Jason. 
Okay, well, <laughs> let's start this out right. I need to be more chased. Oh, yes. no. Okay. <laughs> Who are you going to chase? Brother, uh, brother, I'm going to uh, chase a lounge. When I say that Brother Cripps is a thespian is that uh, he, he has a training and uh, degree in theater arts, and so he's agreed to be an actor tonight. He and I are going to act out a part, uh, uh, a discussion between Paul and a false teacher. Uh, now, before I do that, no, actually, I, I guess I'll read those seven verses uh, before we get started with the, the script. But let me just introduce you to this whole idea. I found out about this idea maybe two years or a year ago and uh, studied it. And I became convinced that this is probably the right way to understand certain port portions of Scripture. So uh, uh, let me read a little excerpt here of uh, my research. It says, in classical rhetoric, prosopopoeia, was one of the exercises used in the training for future orators. Prosopopoeia allows its users to adopt the voices of others. In Greco-Roman rhetorical devices by which the speaker engages in a dialogue with imaginary interlocutors or opponents, this device was popular among Cynic and Stoic rhetoricians and philosophers. Uh, let me speak on that for just for a minute here. Um, the, 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 the premise is that um, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans was intended to be read from this perspective, uh, that um, whoever's reading it would read Paul's thoughts and then read also the thoughts of the false teacher that was against Paul, and while they're reading it, kind of play two parts. Uh, but... We don't have to do that tonight because we have two actors. So uh, we have uh, Brother Cripps and myself. So Brother Cripps will be playing the part of Paul, and I'll play the part of the false teacher. So we're going to take it a step further rather than having one person pretend to be the false teacher. Uh, that's the way uh, it was uh, done by uh, in the first readings to the early churches. Okay. Now, the author puts words in his character's mouth. Uh, so Paul would be putting words, it is speaking the words of the opponent part of the time. I've often wondered by some of the verses attributed to Paul, it just doesn't seem like Paul. And uh, I think this will make sense of that. The result is a dramatic discourse mimicking the to and fro of debate and conversation, although slipping where necessary into more extended speeches by one or the other party. Scholars have long recognized the presence of diatribal material in Paul's letters. Diatribal material is another word for uh, prosopopoeia. And they, they think that this is used in Romans 3, 1 through 9, and Romans 1, 18 through 32. Those are the verses we're going to use as a script. In fact, uh, it's spoken by the opponent who, whom Paul is seeking to refute. Paul composed his letters with the expe expectation that they would be read aloud to the recipients. Think auditors, not readers. Consider this for a second. If Romans was originally composed to be spoken, and if he composed part of it as a diatribe or prosopopoeia, then he probably would have given the bearer of the letter, in this case it would have been Phoebe, if you can see Romans 16, verse 1 and 2, to conclude Phoebe was the one that was given the letter to go read, uh, uh, would give Phoebe sufficient instructions on how it was to be read. The people themselves were largely illiterate, and their reading was an experience of hearing the text. Paul's letters were read out loud by someone, presumably the letter bearer, to an audience. They were performed. In this sense, each letter exists for us rather like the script of an old play, but a script that often preserves only one actor's lines, although an important one. All the explicit stage directions, instructions from the playwright and director, not to mention the original coach performances, have been lost. So we don't have like any notes Paul may have had or, or Phoebe may have had as far as Paul's instructions to Phoebe on how he wanted it to be read. We have to try to piece that together, it says. And there would have been multiple performances. So Romans wasn't read one time to the Church of Romans. Uh, it's assumed that it's read over and over again to different small congregations. And there would have been multiple performances. Romans 
for example, probably involved repeated presentations to the small cells of Christians scattered through the suburbs of that large ancient city. A complete description of the preserved script's possible meanings, then, should take into account the broader range of effects that its full-blooded performance would have entailed within a communal setting. It was an unfolding play, busy with drama, insinuation, color, plot, and movement. And like most plays, it probably had protagonists in some sort of conflict, whether in jest or in a more serious vein. In short, interpretation is best understood as the recovery of a set of performances by a letter bearer to an audience of listening Christians. I have never looked at the New Testament epistles in this light, and yet it becomes obvious. If I have written a letter with the intention that it is to be read out loud to a group of people, I will be sure that the letter reader understands what I've written, and I will instruct them how to perform it properly. And if I have employed the rhetorical device of diatribe in the letter, I will probably instruct him, for example, to alter the intonation and quality of his voice when he speaks in character, just so the audience cannot miss the dialogue between persons. And if I am parroting my opponent's position, then the change in voice actually becomes crucial. This is not something new for first century audiences. They have heard this kind of discourse many times before. Uh, we'll be reading it in a minute, but let me get uh, the, the reaction from uh, Steve uh, to, to this premise and, and also Brother Cripps. All right. <clears throat> I think I got most of that and I think I understand it. Um, are you hearing me all right? I'm going to turn your volume up a little bit. Your volume's a little bit low. Uh, let me try to turn it louder. Go ahead and talk now. Okay. How about now? How's this? That's better. Okay. I turned your volume up. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, I, I think that I, I like the idea, possibly. Um, I think I already have my opinion somewhat uh, from earlier, but I do... Uh, I, I think that kind of an idea makes sense to me. Um, I just don't have a lot of knowledge to to either counteract or say it's right or say it's wrong, other than to uh, let the Holy Spirit tell me if this is a true way to interpret the Scripture or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, your, uh, we did a, a practice run through it before we went live, so, and, and uh, Brother Steve listened to it, and his initial reaction was what? How about I uh, tell my initial reaction after you guys do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, that All makes right. sense. <laughs> okay, Brother Cripps. I don't want to prejudice the, the listeners, uh, you know, Oh, good idea. Or it's been read. Yeah, very, very good idea. Uh, so, Brother Cripps, um, before we read this, uh, the introductory, the foundation I laid, the, the history, uh, these are the assumptions we're making that uh, Paul wrote the letter with the idea that Phoebe would read it to them and that he's writing uh, his point of view compared to the false teachers who are accusing him. And uh, and he he's intending that Phoebe will uh, read part of it with the voice of the false teacher and part of it with Paul's voice. But in this case, we have the two of us playing those two parts. Correct. And uh, keep in mind that in those days, they had uh, various forms of entertainment. But remember, there was no um, technology like we have today. You know, no TVs, um, no radio, no movie theaters. None of that existed. So historically speaking, and not just in the Bible, but just in those times, uh, there were uh, uh, Greek plays. Uh, they're actually um, one of the first groups of people to have regular performances. And uh, so it was well known through the, t through the area that uh, when there was entertainments, um, this is the kind of mechanism that was used. So as Brother Luke has, uh, has said in the introductory portion, he's just trying to say that this is the kind of uh, dialogue uh, and the way to think about the way it's being presented. And then we're, we're going to present the, the conversation uh, as a dialogue, um, not necessarily for entertainment, but this is the way that 
uh, we're thinking it, it should be read. Uh, so I won't say much more than that because I think Steve made a good point that um, we don't want to prejudice anything, but I think reading the introduction and just uh, doing a brief in, uh, intro to it is a good start. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, before we get into the actual uh, play acting here, uh, I want to point out a couple of problems in Romans that uh, I want to ask anybody. If, if this is not the solution to the problem, the, we're offering you a solution to the problem that I, that I think is the right way of understanding it. If this is not the solution, then you're going to have to come up with a, a good explanation of what Paul means. I'll give you a couple of examples. We know that Paul is the champion of the gospel of grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Don't do you dare add any works to it or you've ruined it. That's Paul's theme. Uh, so how do we reconcile some of these things from Paul that, that uh, 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 let me fast forward here a couple of points just to tell you the parts that have always troubled me that never made sense that seems like paul schizophrenic or contradicting himself somehow um okay Let's see okay uh okay here it says um who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So this verse 7 here, if this is Paul speaking, Paul is saying to those people who are being patient, continuing to do well-doing, good works, and they're seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. That verse 7 is contrary to Paul's message. Verse 7 is saying, to, for people, uh, the people are going to uh, gain eternal life and immortality through by doing good. Um, and um, another one, this is a, this is the one that's always bothered me. Have you ever heard this one? For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, if I was to just quote this verse to anybody and ask them, what, where is that in the scriptures? They'd probably say, well, that's in the book of James. Doesn't sound like Paul to me. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. You see? So those verses there have never to me, it's never sounded like Paul's teaching. So that's why I believe, unless you have a good explanation for me to make that make sense, uh, I'd like to hear it. But uh, let's let me get your thoughts on that before we begin the actual reading here uh, brother Steve what those verses there you see how they trouble me if that's Paul's actual teaching brother Steve you still with us I guess not brother Cripps yeah, you there I was trying to push the button sorry okay um, uh, those, those, those verses I just read that I, I say, if, if, those are, if that's what Paul is teaching, it's contrary to all of his other teaching. What do you say? Well, um, I, without looking at the context, and, and again, you know, like uh, I'm sure Renee would say, uh, since she's not here, um, and I agree with this, that, you know, context is always key. And I think that, um, you know, I, if I was to actually sit down and, and look at, at the verses around it and see what, what is actually being said, you know, um, that there might be a logical explanation or maybe what we're proposing here uh, could be the best explanation. I don't know. Um, I think... I, like I said, I don't want to prejudice too much um, and say this is a possible way of interpreting the scripture and, and um, you know, uh, but I, I would agree, you know, um, that if you take one verse out by itself in any way, you can make it say whatever you want. And that, of course, is always dangerous to do. Okay, so. thanks. Uh, all right, Brother Chris, before we get into the reading, uh, those trouble verses that I just read that troubled me, 
that have always made me wonder, it doesn't make sense. It sounds different than Paul's message. So uh, what do you say about that? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's going to come out in, in, the, uh, in the way that we're reading it. I think the, the audience will uh, pick up on those as they're uh, presented. But in general, I, I want to switch a little bit to the idea of interpretation. The thing about interpreting the word, it can only be done by a person whose eyes and ears are open by the Holy Spirit. So um, I, I would concentrate on the idea that uh, all we do is present the material and the, uh, the audience, uh, the Holy Spirit, I mean, will be um, uh, totally responsible for, for showing that light if it indeed is, um, it matches what your, uh, what your ideas are. Um, I certainly agree. Uh, I never really wrestled with this particular passage, but when we started talking about it, I think a week or two ago, um, I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from, and um, I, th I think that there may be something to it. That's uh, I, Like I said, I don't want to talk too much about it. I'm trying to answer your questions, but I, I, I want to let the, let the information uh, come out on its own. Yeah, it's like if you say too much, you're, you're spoiling the plot of the movie. Yes, it's like it's like going to a movie and then before the movie, some guy comes out and he explains to you what you're about to see. I mean, okay. you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to uh, read it or act it out right now. And um, keep in mind, uh, uh, almost all theologians understand and agree that early church history, there was a uh, transitional period. In the beginning, it was all Jews. Finally, they let Gentiles in. In the beginning, they wanted the Gentiles to become Jews, and finally they relented on that. So there was a transition, and uh, during this transitional period, which was at least 30 years, 30 years, uh, there was these teachers who were following Paul around, and they're called Judaizers, and Paul references them many times. They were accusing Paul of being a false apostle and saying that he's given people a license to sin, and uh, keep that in mind. So this dialogue is between Paul and that, that one of those false uh, teachers. So, uh, all right, brother, let's begin. I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is by the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, 
fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, wheresoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest does the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and the forbearance, and the long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and the impotent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous, disjudge, the righteous judgment of God. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are even more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest not thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Though that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou, thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth. If thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God.
What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Oh, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Well, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say, let us do evil that, that good may come. Whose damnation is just. Oh, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have been proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understand this. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. Their poison of apps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it, sh it saith them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope that when people, uh, who, whoever actually listen to this now, and who listen to this in the future, I'm very, very interested into their about their thoughts and their reaction. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing like the chat room has paid any attention at all to this. I don't see one comment in the chat room regarding this subject. But let me ask Brother Steve, tell me your reaction now and initially to this. Uh, what do you think? Um, well, I'll try to <laughs> repeat myself as... Uh, best as I can from what I said earlier. Uh, <clears throat> my first reaction to this was, wow. Um, and that the, you know, my, my inner man that, you know, is connected with the Holy Spirit was just humming with, with joy and, and hearing it read that way. Um, and it really makes, to me, a lot of sense having it read that way. And it really sounds like what you'd have today if you had a lordship salvationist arguing against a free grace gospel preacher. Someone, you know, defending the gospel of, of the grace of God by faith alone. And, and someone who is saying, no, you must work for it. And if you work for it, you'll gain eternal life and all that nonsense that they that they preach. So, it, you know, it's quite the difference. And, you know, um, as I've read the Pauline epistles, you know, before and many times, you know, I've seen places where it certainly, you know, uh, comes across at least. It has to me that Paul is stating an opinion of someone else in his letter, and then he's defending against it in his letter. So, and then to have this this idea of how to read it and how maybe it was read in the past originally, to me, 
goes together and makes a lot of sense with both what I've having heard it read that way and uh, you know prior study myself and and having you know teachers show me that uh, that this is you know he's showing one idea that is wrong and then he's telling the right idea after um, that kind of a thing and it, it just makes a lot of sense to me and to the, my other reaction after hearing it a second time is more please <laughs> I want to hear more of it read that way. Right on, so, Steve. So I think you guys did an excellent job uh, both times, both before and after, and uh, now while we did it live. So um, I think you guys did a great job. And so thanks, thanks Steve. Yep. Appreciate, appreciate it, brother. Okay, now, brother Cripps, uh, you know, I, I I've known about this. I've been talking about this for a year or two, and, and but this was brand new to you. I just I just threw this at you, and uh, and Steve too, and so we know Steve's reaction, and I'd like to know yours. I, I believe that that it fit perfectly, one line after another. The 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 argument and the rebuttal, the argument and the rebuttal. It seemed to be written perfectly for that in that way. Oh, I can, I, I can fill in time answering that. <laughs> um, I think it's brilliant, actually. Um, the thing about being a thespian is reading um, so many scripts, you start to see things that way naturally anyway. I mean, even reading like a novel and fiction, uh, see how the storyline uh, plays out and how the different characters uh, present their different ideas. Um, so, yes, you're right. I, I hadn't, uh, I've read this uh, verse many times. Um, Romans is, uh, uh, probably my favorite book of the Bible. I think I might've mentioned that to you before, uh, particularly the Romans five, one through eight, um, uh, scripture. I mean, it's, it's related only in saying how much I appreciate this, uh, this book. Um, but, uh, when we first started talking about it and I read over it a couple of times, I started to see it, but it really didn't have the same impact until we just read it. I mean, even reading it before the show. Um, being, being on air is different. And the second time I read it, um, it, uh, it, it kind of convale uh, convalesced isn't the right word. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, um, it, it, uh, concreted the idea that this is the way it was supposed to be read. I think it's fantastic. And, uh, I agree with Steve, you know, I, I almost wish there was, uh, you know, another dialogue. Maybe we should think about doing it again. And before I hand it over to you, um, people were listening. Uh, Hendrix uh, in the uh, chat room says, uh, "Sin City preacher, we are uh, we see people try to justify themselves by their flesh all the time when they need the gift of the spirit of righteousness to dwell in them instead." So I just want to throw that out there. And I did see a couple people um, saying that they enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the dramatic reading. So yeah, I think I think some people were paying attention. So that's always nice. Uh, yeah, I did see uh, Hendrix and Jessica and uh, someone else. If I, I'll go back through it more carefully in a minute, but I know th there were some people that listened and understood, and uh, maybe will actually value this because to me this is a this is a revelation. In my opinion, it, it's that important, and I'll tell you why. Not only do I now understand these problem verses uh, where Paul is saying that uh, it's not the hearers of the the law but the doers of the law you know that's contrary to everything paul taught and yet he, we think he's teaching that uh and then and then also uh the earlier part about hey uh those who are seeking to do good and do all these wonderful things uh then they're they're they're, they're seeking immortality and eternal life you know um well that's that's eternal life through works and so these things are contrary to paul's uh teaching and uh, this way, it, it makes sense because it's not Paul's teaching. It's the false teacher, and Paul is arguing with him. But the, uh, the what really, I didn't talk about this before, but I, I believe that there are going to be some people that will reject this because they don't want to give up Paul's uh, uh, tirade against homosexuals. Now, as we read that, brother, 
the part against the homosexuals, that was the false teacher. I read that part as the false teacher. That was the false teacher speaking. That's the Jewish religious, you know, Pharisee. You know, Pharisees became believers, but they didn't give up their spiritual pride, self-righteousness. And, you know, there's accounts of that all over the, 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 the New Testament. They're, they became believers, but they're still full of spiritual pride and hypocrisy. And these people, they hated the Gentiles, they, particularly in Rome. It was the worst. Rome was famous for its homosexuality and this, uh, the horrible life. That, and, but people want to go there and say, see what the Apostle Paul said? The Apostle Paul preached against the homosexuals, but I don't think he did. I think that's the false teacher preaching against it. And Paul's replying back to, wait a second, you're being very judgmental here. You know, you look in the mirror, you're guilty of some sin too, aren't you? We're going to go through back through the whole thing very carefully. But that's that's the thing. I, I think some people who love the idea that Paul is coming hard against homosexuals, they, they are going to reject this because they don't want that to be, they want that to remain Paul's belief. What's your thoughts about that? Oh, I completely agree. Um, it, it, the, the way that it's broken up as far as the way we read the dialogue and um, I, and also the way you read it, you know, kind of the attitude that you have, I think was perfect to uh, represent that idea. I think it sold it uh, pretty well, actually. And yeah, so the the rebuttals that Paul does is is kind of redirecting it, as you said before the show, making it about what the uh, f the, the false teacher is saying and not about the homosexuals, not about all the sinners. And in fact, he's directing it back towards towards uh, people that are judgmental of others, knowing that we're all sinners and uh, knowing that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's God that gives the forgiveness and only through him. And that if you're judging someone, you're condemning yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, by the way, um, the the way that you read that brother was exactly what I was uh, asking and hoping for. Uh, the basically, you were um, speaking to me. Your speech was right back to me. This false teacher that's condemning all these people. You were replying back to me. Wait a second. You're you're a false teacher. You need to look in the mirror and judge yourself. You know. Yes, sir. And so, with that thought in mind, it, it all fits together perfectly. So, uh, well, let's let's go through all, all again. Let's, uh, uh, Brother Steve, uh, you didn't reply to my my theory. I, I have a theory that some people will reject this um, idea of prosopopoeia uh, that Paul is using prosopopoeia here, and he's he's reading the part of the false teacher and and uh, his part, and and they reject that because they love the portion where they're railing hard against homosexuals. What do you think of that? Well, I think that um, no matter whether you have the prosopopoeia idea of interpretation or, or not, if you are looking at the, the Bible from a standpoint of grace plus works, not grace through faith alone, that, or, or if you hate a certain particular personal lifestyle of other people and can't seem to come to grips with the fact that God loves every single sinner, every single person, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, you know, I, I basically I've said this before, no matter what you're looking for in the Bible, if if you're not looking for it with with asking God to show you his truth in the in his word, if you're looking for for things in the Bible for ulterior motives, you'll find whatever you're looking for. Because, you know, unless, unless you are taking the entire counsel of the Word of God, unless you are using context of Scripture, 
And even without the prosopopoeia, I can, you know, go through the book of Romans and show how Paul is, you know, setting up the idea, like towards the end of what Jason was saying, you know, yes, this is what happened to sinners because they turned their back on, on God and didn't have salvation. This is, you know, to me, before the idea of the prosopopoeia, which to me makes, makes it, you know, make a lot more sense in that way. But at the same time, you know, um, all of us who are not saved or, or when we were not saved, you know, the, the, the deeper we get into sin, sin eventually brings death. And I think that's the, you know, the, the whole thing where God will give you over to what you want because he's a gentleman. You know, he's not going to force his will and his, his, you know, his plan on you, whether you're saved or not. He's not going to make you walk with him, even if you're saved. And he's not going to make you believe in him if you don't want to. So, you know, I, I, I've always seen Paul setting up the whole thing to show how we're all, yes, we are all without excuse because God is there and he's here and he's been trying to, to love each and every person. You know, if you don't believe your, you know, eternal consequence is just, but if you do believe, it's only by his righteousness, you know, as you read through Romans, you know, you see how he shows that it's not my, it's not our personal righteousness because our personal righteousness is filthy rags. Our, there's no one righteous. So we must have the righteousness of God. And, you know, I see him setting this up to show that, like, every single idea of any kind of sin without perfection and the perfection of Christ, that perfection, without that perfection, we are all doomed. We are all lost. You can try to justify it no matter what way you do. But at the end of the day, if you try to justify by the law, your damnation is just. If you justify by Christ's justification of you through his blood and his resurrection, then you are righteous indeed and are seated in heavenly places. Now and forever. Amen. Yeah. Uh, well, the... I'll add to that, brother Luke, if you want. Yeah, All right. So, um, yeah, Steve, you're absolutely right on, brother. That's uh, kind of what I was saying about it. it's up to the Holy Spirit to interpret it. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, presenting it like it does helps someone who may, who may be kind of struggling with that until the uh, the Holy Spirit gets them to the point where it's a, more of a natural thing, um, especially just uh, someone starting out in the Word. Um, I think in some ways it would avoid a lot of confusion for a, uh, a new believer, especially, uh, you know, because I, you know, I, I think there are many passages in scriptures that uh, until we do have the, the uh, direct influencing of the Holy Spirit in order to help us interpret, because here's the truth of it. There are so many denominations out there and so many different pastors and many of them twist scripture. So uh, there's a lot of people sitting in churches and they, and it depends on what the particular pastor's idea of that passage is, and if he's not relying on the Holy Spirit to give him uh, the the way to uh, preach these passages and verses, then people can easily be misled. So, uh, Steve, I agree with your point, uh, absolutely, uh, but I also uh, see the purpose of, again, especially for someone um, starting out with reading these uh, these verses in, uh, in the in the chapter, um, I think it's extremely helpful to look at it that way. It's an effective tool, in my opinion, but uh, this is great. Uh, 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 great points by everyone so far. Back to you. Um, if I could just say real quick, I think that's an excellent point, Jason, uh, especially for babes in Christ. That's awesome. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> now, uh, we, we stand in agreement. You usually do, most of the time. Uh, but... Uh, Last Wednesday, before we got into the scripture, we spent probably a half an hour laying a foundation, as I said, talking about the historicity 
uh, of this book. We want to know who wrote it, a little bit about the person, what their main message, what they're trying to get across in the book, who they're writing it to, the year it was written, because it, it makes a difference. What point in church history was it written? The church wasn't the same in uh, 30 uh, AD as it was in you know 70 AD. Um, and it, went, it changed a lot, uh, you know, from Pentecost till uh, Gentiles came in with Cornelius, that's 10 years. So for 10 years, there's not even a Gentile in it. And then it, it took 20 years from Pentecost before they, they had the Jerusalem Council, where they were uh, trying to settle the issue of if someone has to be circumcised. That's 20 years after Pentecost. So I, a person, if a person knows all these things about the timeline of all these events, about this struggle for doctrine in the beginning of the church, uh, and then it's, it, you're more going to probably more likely to understand the true meaning and intention of the scriptures if you have that in mind. And I do think that if it is correct, I, I, I'm, I, I've come to the conclusion that I do think this is the correct way of understanding it. Now, as someone who's brand new to it, I can understand if you, if you, you, you either believe it or you don't, or you're leaning that way or not, you know, you don't need to make up your mind right now. Uh, maybe uh, someday you'll uh, reject it or, or be convinced that this is the correct way. This is really what happened. But I think when we understand the history and everything that was going on, we understand that Paul was, he was, born in the Jewish family line, Benjamin, but he was born as a Roman citizen. He, uh, he became uh, one of the strictest Pharisees, he studied under Gamaliel, the main teacher. And, and yet and he also studied Greek philosophy. He was highly educated. There's no writer in, in any of the books, especially in the New Testament, there's no writer that has the level of education and scholarship that, that Paul had. He was very, very learned. He, he, he knew about Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, all this stuff he knew about, and he used all of that. And the idea that he would use Greek oratory techniques, like prosopopoeia, uh, is uh, certainly uh, very believable to me. And then when we actually apply it and read it in that way, it makes more sense than it ever did before to me. Okay, your, your feedback before we go back to oh, scriptures. There's one more point I want to make, but I'll make that after you, you guys reply. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, sorry, I was having trouble pushing the... I was the keeping... I was trying to... I was trying to keep the same order, or, order. You go first and then I follow up. That seems to work out pretty well. Yeah, I was just trying. I, I kept, I tried to push the unmute button, my, my mic button like three times. And it was like, no, I don't want to be pushed. <laughs> you don't um, want to be pushed. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, I, I, I definitely agree with, with what you were saying there, Luke. Um, especially about understanding uh, who the writer is, his audience, the time period in which it was written. And in understanding those things, it's certainly uh, a very feasible, uh, uh, you know, a, a very intellectually feasible idea to propose that Paul would use this kind of um, technique in his writings knowing who he is what you know what kind of a you know teacher he was and the audience who he was writing to would also the fact that his audience would be familiar with this kind of an i uh this kind of teaching style to me makes a lot of sense as well and and looking at it that way um and of course this is all you know theory and we want you to you know no matter what, not listen to us, but listen to the Holy Spirit as as you study the the Word of God. So I think that's the most important thing, no matter what we're doing, and always read Scripture in context and never put, cherry pick verses to to suit an idea. 
Um, I think that's also important, but, um, you know, knowing, knowing the audience, knowing the writer, knowing the time period and what was going on then. And, and all of that is, is called hermeneutics. And that's a part of proper study of scripture and applying this principle of, of, of reading or listening to, to the, to Paul's letters to me seems to make a lot of sense. And, and, um, for me, I, I definitely, both times it was read, felt the, the Holy Spirit confirming to me that this is, you know, this is definitely a very solid way to interpret Paul's teachings. Matter of fact, I wish I could, you know, go through all of, all of Paul's teachings and be able to figure out when he's doing that and, and kind of block it up by either highlighting or circling where Paul is is responding and where there's a, a, a an inappropriate teaching or an incorrect teaching in between. That, I think that would be a really great help and study guide to to make and then to give to to babes in Christ. I think that would be awesome if we couldn't perform it for him or point him to a performance like this. Thanks. I'm going to yeah. ask Brother oh. Cripps to repl- respond, but I, before you do, I just want to say uh, amen, because you, you just took the next step. You said, okay, if prosopopoeia could be a, a correct application of these verses, could Paul have used prosopopoeia, uh, prosopopoeia technique anywhere else in his writings? I think a person would be very, very wise to keep that in the back of their mind as they're reading all of Paul's epistles and ask themselves throughout, is it possibly prosopopy he's using here? Because there are some other places where I suspect that could be the case. Brother Cripps? Yeah, so I'll go off what Steve said. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Steve. I completely agree with you. And the other thing, too, is if people have the idea that we've presented here in the pro, uh, um idea, then if they, they can learn to do that in their own minds as they're reading it. I mean, they don't even have to write it out as a script necessarily, though that is extremely helpful. And also I'll say that I am noticing more people that uh, are commenting that they wish they could have more, Brother Luke. So it may it may be even worth considering, uh, you know, kind of following a pattern and doing some more of scripture where you find that um, that might work out in a, in a dramatic reading sort of situation. Um, I, a lot of people aren't doing that. That's another thing. I mean, I know you're not out just to be popular and stuff. You're you're here to present the word of God and help people in their walk. But um, if if this many people, uh, this the first time that this being presented, if this many people seem to enjoy it, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying it might be something to consider in the uh, in the future. And I I definitely uh, appreciate everyone that's that's made a comment as far as the reading is concerned. Um, it was very enjoyable. And the last thing I'll say is. Uh, Steve, you're exactly right as far as the Holy Spirit uh, working through it. It's, it's kind of what I said before we went on air, that being on air is one thing and uh, doing a dry reading is another. Um, they're completely different. It's kind of the difference between rehearsal and uh, actually doing the performance. So uh, the the first one wasn't bad or anything, but the second one, especially after uh, uh, Brother Luke was able to direct. See, an actor only does does things the way that they're told to do it. And, of course, they have their own you know, internal idea of how they do things, knowing that what their particular uh, talents are. But uh, a director does a good job by just making little subtle suggestions. And Brother Luke did a good job of that. And I think the Holy Spirit really uh, brought it home. Uh, so, yeah, I would always be open to do something like that again, because anything that has to do with uh, uh, script reading or performances and stuff like that, uh, you don't have to ask me. I'm already there. Okay, thanks. I, um, I I have noticed that uh, some people have made some uh, comments about what we've actually done tonight. Uh, there's all kinds of other things going on in chat rooms as a rule, uh, and I don't. That's fine. You know, there's all personal issues that people need to fellowship, and uh, that's fine. But if if someone did listen to us and gave us feedback, uh, I appreciate it. But. Uh, <laughs> If you did not, if you joined this program after we read it, did the dramatic reading, then I, I'm going to ask you, 
to make sure when we're this is uploaded that you go back and watch it from the beginning and make a comment. I'm going to say the same thing at the very end of our program tonight, too. Please go back and watch it from the beginning and give us a comment uh, about the idea that's been put forth to you. Yeah, the idea is maybe some of these thoughts are not Paul's thoughts, but the, th the thoughts of the false teachers that are uh, the antagonists to Paul. And this is actually a, an illustration of an argument between Paul and the false teachers. So, um, uh, and some of the people making comments, I've uh, noticed that they're making comments based based upon coming in late. They don't know even what the point was we, we made. So, uh, sad, it's sad to me that you, you didn't, uh, weren't able to get it, but I hope you'll go back and watch it. The other thing I'll say is that the false teacher is was very interesting to me because uh, he's a false teacher, but not everything he says is false. I mean, this is a perfect example. If we look at all the words that we said, that's from the false teacher. Uh, some of that stuff, we, we'd be saying amen, you know. But uh, what Paul's really against is the attitude of judgmentalism and uh, that uh, uh, of the false teachers. And uh, that, uh, you know, throw it back in their face that, hey, uh, you want to be judgmental, man, you know, I can throw it right back at you. If you, you, you follow, follow the law perfectly, you better, you know, it's kind of like examine your, yourself kind of thing he, he's given back to him. And uh, so it, it's not necessarily everything the false teacher says, but the attitude of being condemning uh, of, of others. And it's, it's the same thing as the Pharisee and the publican. The publican says, I mean, the Pharisees, oh, thank you, God. I'm so glad I'm not like these other men. Can't, can't you get that same attitude from this false teacher? That's the attitude that I had as I read it. Oh, these whole stupid Roman Gentiles, you know, they're just a bunch of homosexuals and, you know, they're filthy. And, I mean, uh, I'm not like them. Uh, and then, the, of course, the publican saying, oh, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's what Paul is, is saying. Hey, don't judge them. We're all sinners. We just need to rely on Jesus is, is, is Paul's attitude. That's why those things do not fit the teachings of Paul. That's why it, 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 does, it doesn't make sense the other way. Uh, okay, so what do you think of the idea that some of the things in the, the false teacher said are true? I mean, what he says about the creation bearing witness you know, uh, that there, there's a God. I, I've always loved that portion of scripture just because of the, it, it's part of what the false teacher said doesn't invalidate the truth of it. False teachers know scriptures and sometimes quote scriptures too. You guys are slow on the button, huh? <laughs> no, Steve, well, I'm trying to follow in order because that, that seems to work really well with the dynamics. So, Steve, you got you got to be on it, bro. Come on, man. I'm I'm on it. I'm on it. Uh, I'm just used to you know when uh, Brother Luke does uh, the Sunday uh, service, he usually put uh, pick specific people in order. You know, kind of flip flops the order back and forth and stuff. Yeah, uh, but we're, so we're we're finding our own pace, Steve. Come on. All right, all right, we're finding our own pace. Um, just kidding, everybody. <laughs> One thing that is truly interesting with with any any type of false teacher, um, they the uh, I hate to say it like this, but the best false teachers, which is a poor way of putting it, or, um, uh, because they're not good by any stretch of the means, but uh, the ones that that seem to be the most effective in in bring in in causing confusion and uh, leading people astray from from the truth are those that mix truth with a lie. Um, and the closer they get to the truth, and the littler bit of lie that they can, the su smallest little bit of lie they can put in it uh for them the better and so of course they would be using the truth and of course i'm also stating this all from the perspective of using this uh prosopopoeia idea that's a hard word to remember and say 
Um, yeah, the other thing, the other thing, I'll just interject real quick, Steve. The other thing is every sure. time, every time he says it, I think of the the uh, Mexican restaurants. It's actually a dessert. It's like a doughy kind of thing with the powdered sugar on it and and uh, drizzled with honey. So <laughs> that that's what I think of every time someone says it. Uh, now I want one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A pro sopapilla, I mean, it's a person who likes those uh, sopapillas. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And yeah. that's me, by the way. It, yeah. That's me. By, by the way, uh, if if I spelled it out and you, you just you didn't know how to pronounce it, but I just spelled it out and you tried to pronounce it, it'd, it'd be hard to figure it out. Uh, when I first started learning and teaching about this, I had to go to the phonetics and I had to write it out phonetically and the first videos I made on it, I kept on mispronouncing it, and it, it, but now it's easy. I just it's it's like the sopapilla. That's how I remember it. The sopapilla, of it, it's pro sopapilla. Yeah, you can you can dice it up a little bit. Yeah, so it's pro soap a p a. Yeah. That's what it is. So then you put all that together, pro sopapilla. Pro yeah. sopapilla. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't say it for weeks. I couldn't get it right. But uh, okay. Uh, why don't we now go through the scriptures line by line and see how far we get from where we left off in the last week. But uh, I wanted to uh, just introduce this idea for everybody to consider, not only for these scriptures, but keep this in the back of your mind, because maybe this will help you understand other other writings of Paul. I, I don't I don't know if any other Bible writer has, has used this technique. I, I kind of doubt it, but I, I, I'm pretty sure Paul used it. Um, okay, so let's go back now. Let me see. Uh, oh, where are we? Okay. Let's read it now from verse. Um, we finished at verse 7 last Wednesday. So beginning with verse 8, I'll read. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Okay, let me stop there, verse 8 and 9. Do you guys have this in front of you? Do you want me to post it in the chat room? Or do you have it you're looking at it? Uh, I would prefer because I've got my screen set up exactly the way I want it. And if I do it, it'll mess it up. I mean, if I go, I mean, I can look it up, but uh, if, if you could post it in there, if it's easy for you, that would be helpful. I'll post it right here. Uh... Yes, there it is. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Brother Cripps, uh, uh, we'll go with you first instead of Steve, since he's really slow on this button anyway, and you're already talking. So uh, first, oh, I think man. My... <laughs> oh, that, that was a shot from the side of the face, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, was a, was a, yeah, I know what he means by, oh, man, uh, he's, he's like. I'm well, the... I got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I got something to say. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right, uh, Steve, then you can keep going first here. Read verse eight and nine and just tell me what you think of that. Uh, maybe let Jason go first if he's got it. Okay, I've got it right here in the private chat, but you don't have access oh. to that on your phone. Uh, let me see. The private chat area. How about I read it and then Steve can comment first. So Steve, I'll read it. Don't don't worry about uh, looking it up. I'll read it and then okay. you comment. Okay. Yeah. I have private chat, but I don't have access to whatever wherever yeah. you put it. So I, I understand. It's all good. All right. Here you go. Uh, verse eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Steve? Button. There's the button. All right. Um, that, what a testimony. What a testimony to have. 
I mean, if there was a testimony that a believer could want to have, that would be it. That that my faith or your faith is spoken about through the whole world. I mean, that isn't that the idea. I mean, not not for not for pride's sake, but to be a light set on a hill. To 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 be the love of Jesus in, in the world that shines bright in people's hearts and we let them see our good deeds so that they glorify God. And isn't that the objective? To get people to see the truth of Christ in us so that they want it and seek after it and become a believer themselves. So, and then, you know, on, on the other, on the second part of that verse, you know, Paul says, I, I, I don't stop praying for you. And as far as our relationship and how we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ, I think that's how we should be treating each other. Always with care, always with prayer, always praying for each other. Not, oh, I'll pray for you, and then you forget about it the next moment. You know, when somebody says they have a prayer request, actually taking time to pray for them regularly, not just like one time, you know, or bless them, Lord, and that's all you do. You know, the, the one verse that comes to mind, and uh, I've heard it read a couple times recently in uh, Matthias's private chat, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And there's two things in that verse. One is of a righteous man or woman. And that righteousness is not my own. That's the righteousness of Christ. And the second thing is, is fervent prayer. It's not a one-time request. It's, you know, like the, the, the woman that kept going to the judge over and over and over asking for something. And it was her persistence that got the judge to get, grant her, her request. Amen. You know, um, and thereby the first word, the effectual, it's effective because it's fervent. It's continual, and it comes from a believer who has the righteousness of Christ. So I think, you know, you break that verse down in, into the kind of uh, witness and testimony that we want to have, testimony of other people about us, the kind of witness that we want to bring to the world, and the, the type of relationships that we should ha be having with other believers. Gosh, Steve, I love following you, man, because you give me a lot of places to go. I appreciate that. So uh, the first verse, um, I, I agree, agree complete. What a testimony that that is. Um, he says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. How amazing is that? Reaching every place where people haven't heard it. And it comes back to Paul. And then he 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 gives them this encouragement. That is a huge testimony. And if if someone says that about me, of course I give all glory to God. But if someone says about me that with everything that I do, and as as much effort as I try to to put into uh, saying yes to any opportunity that that uh, God puts in front of me, I mean if if I even get half that, you know, I, I would be happy if it was one person. But this in this case, it's it's spoken of throughout the whole world. Um, the other point I want to make that you brought up, Steve, uh, first of all, what you said about prayer, yes, yes, yes. Fervent prayer is necessary. Um, I, I kind of wish people could actually see, see the prayers going up. The scripture is, uh, is ripe with um, uh, descriptions of 
uh, all the prayers of the saints coming up and, and God being able to see it and how sweet the prayers are. Prayers have power, folks. And uh, one of the things you touched on, Steve, I, w I was one of those people, unfortunately. Um, I guess I shouldn't say unfortunately because uh, where, every place that I've been in my life, God used it uh, to, to mold me. So now, even as I'm speaking this, when I look back at a time, it's not that I didn't care about people. But I think in, in uh, churches especially, it, it becomes kind of a flippant thing. You know, it's like someone comes up and says, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm applying for a job. You know, I've been out of work for a while and I'm hoping I really get it. And, you know, you're sipping coffee, you know, and, and talking and stuff. You'd say, oh, yeah, brother, I'll pray for you. And Steve, you're right. They absolutely forget. I was guilty of that all the time. Now, it was a little more serious, you know, if, if I deemed it serious, if someone, you know, oh, oh, my gosh, someone was in a car accident, of course, if I said I was going to pray for someone, I would pray. Um, the, he's made a lot of changes in my life. And now if I tell someone I'm going to pray for it, regardless of how ridiculous it might seem to me, I pray, uh, I pray for it. And the last thing I'll say just about prayer, because that is such a huge topic. Yeah, praying fervently without ceasing. Uh, a lot of people get the idea that uh, without ceasing means that you're just supposed to just be on your in your prayer closet forever and not be a part of life and just be praying before God. Well, unfortunately for most of us, we don't have the finances to be able to do that, but you don't have to. Uh, praying without ceasing, praying is just a conversation with God. He's with us wherever we go. You can pray while you're at work without saying anything while you're um, serving a customer. You're in an attitude of prayer. A prayer is, prayer is a lifestyle. You don't have to be on your knees, though that is the fervent prayer part for me. I'm not saying it's for everybody. But when uh, I'm really being fervent about something and I'm praying before God, for me, um, I feel humble and I feel hu humility when I do it on my knees. And, and you, you're right. You have to keep doing it again and again and again. And the last thing that I'll say is... Um, I'm learning, I'm in a place in my life right now. And I, 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 I just can't tell you how God keeps showing me, uh, how, uh, merciful and kind and loving he is to all of us. Uh, but, uh, I, I can only speak for myself and I have, uh, recently seen a lot of, uh, uh, evidence and, uh, some things have come up for me that uh, some of the things that I've prayed for for a very, very long time are just now uh, coming true for me. Uh, one thing in particular I've been praying for for 34 years. 34 years. And it is uh, uh, something that's uh, really kind of a fabric of, of my life. And uh, it, it would be a long story to tell here, so I'll save it for another time. But just just believe me. Uh, sometimes we pray for something and we don't get an answer and we get frustrated with God. And and we think that he doesn't listen to us. And it's easy to do. We live in a broken, fallen world. Everything that we face every day uh, makes it more and more difficult sometimes to see God. So it's easy in your circumstances to think, oh, you know, I pray for, I keep praying for this and it doesn't ever happen. Well, the thing he's shown me is that my prayer was answered at the moment I prayed it. It just took me 34 years to get it. So uh, is that true for everyone else? Whether it is or isn't, God's, God will answer your prayers. Sometimes his answer is yes. Sometimes his, his answer is no. And sometimes his answer is wait. Wait on the Lord. If you wait on the Lord, you will find an answer. He will always answer you. He's not going to ever ignore you ever. He loves you and he cares about you. Amen. Thanks for the time. Yeah, amen. Uh, the, the verse before this says to all that be in Rome. So um, he's speaking about the believers in Rome. And, uh, you know, when I was preparing to do this study on Romans, you know that I was talking, I wanted to lay a foundation who, what, when, where, why, all that stuff before we went into the scripture. We've talked about that several times now, but one of the things that uh, I learned uh, is that uh, the church in Rome 
Um, nobody knows who, who, for sure who established the church in Rome. It's theorized that uh, a church member in Corinth moved to Rome and started it. And that's why Paul has this affinity because one of his disciples went and started this church in Rome. Um, I'm not positive about that, but uh, the, another thing to consider is that he says to all that be in Rome, remember uh, that little intro I read at the beginning, uh, it's very, uh, uh, very much accepted that not only were the churches just little small congregations in people's homes, we hear the church at Phoebe's house, the church at you know, uh, someone's house, I don't remember the name, but there's a couple of examples in the book of Acts, the church in their house. And they were all house churches. I had a house church here uh, in my house for seven years. We had five or six people sometime. Sometimes we had 25 people. Uh, but it was a wonderful uh, uh, copy of the first churches that were in people's homes. And it wasn't until couple hundred years uh, to church history before they started building buildings and, and uh, cathedrals and that kind of a thing. Uh, so it's likely Paul is not only did he write the letter with the intention that will be read over and over again in all these different home churches, but Paul's letter is to all of those. He says to all that be in Rome, not to just one little congregation of, of you know, 10, 15 people that meet at one person's house. It's maybe 10 or 20 houses all over Rome with, you know, 10 or 20 people in each one. And the letter would be read by Phoebe over and over again, as, as we described it to each of each of those congregations. But the church in Rome, just like we know, the church is not an individual building. The church is, is corporate. The whole, all of the members, all of the believers make up the church in Rome. But I would say that, um, um, your faith is spoken throughout the world. Uh, uh, I that that's impressive, but well, I'm sure that just means like the known world or the the the, the world as as they uh, understood. They weren't aware of every place in the world necessarily. But this next verse nine, it says, uh, "For God is my witness." I mean, I don't. I, I think most people probably refrain from saying, "God is my witness." It's more like swearing an oath almost. Uh, and Jesus said, don't swear an oath. Don't swear an oath to the temple or even the gold that's in the temple or anything else. Just my yes is yes and my no is no. But Paul is, is uh, actually uh, stating very, very uh, uh, adamantly, for God is my witness. In other words, hey, I really, really mean this. Take me very seriously that uh, I'm praying for you without ceasing. And uh, praying without ceasing. You know, we have a, there's a word. Once I started learning about computers years ago, struggling to learn all the basics and gradually getting a little bit better, I, uh, I learned a word very early in my computer studies, and that was the word default. What's your defaults set at? And uh, our, our default regarding prayer should, that should be the default all the time. That's what I think Paul means when he says, uh, continue instant in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Well, we can't really pray without ceasing because right now I'm not praying because I have to think of what I'm going to say and say it. So I, my prayer is ceased. But continue instant in prayer means that as soon as your mind is not occupied, the default is it goes right back into fellowship with God. As you said, it's a conversation with God. Who do we love the most? Who do we want to talk to the most? Well, immediately, as soon as my mind is freed up, I'm talking to God again. I think that's what he wants the default to be for all of us. All right. Uh, anything more before we go to the next verses? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to add one more thing with what uh, Jason was saying, and you were saying about conversation that, you know, prayer is a conversation between, you know, us and, and God. And, you know, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, and in some of the past shows on, on, on true story live, you know, we've been talking about, 
uh, we talked about listening and talking and that, you know, I don't know if I'm sure we've, many of us are familiar with true listening uses two ears and one mouth. Um, so, you know, I think it's the same way in our relationship with God and, you know, to be praying without ceasing doesn't necessarily require me to be speaking all the time either. And I think it's important to, to remember that, you know, we can, we can be praying and not speaking a word and just listening to God. And we can be just listening to listening for God speaking as we're going through our day and, and doing things and just being aware and, and waiting for him to, you know, may, may, maybe you're, you know, at work or you're, you're walking to the coffee shop and you're just aware for God's presence, aware and, and, and just listening with the idea that if God speaks to me, I'm available to hear. And, you know, perhaps, you know, because of that, God draws your attention to someone at the coffee shop that you have no idea who they are, but something in what they're saying or doing, you overhear or whatever, causes you to realize God wants me to go talk to this person. Or, you know, God want, you see somebody, you know, a homeless person or, or something, you know, like that, where, you know, because you're aware and listening for God's instruction or, you know, the gentle direction of the Holy Spirit to guide you as you go throughout your day. I think that's part of a, pr of a prayer life, too, where, where you're listening. You're not necessarily just asking for God for things all the time, um, you know. Um, but I, of course, I do think asking God for things is important, especially in your own walk and for for things like love, you know, the fruits of the Holy Spirit wisdom, understanding, and all of that, um, I think, you know, are all valid parts and should be part of our prayer life as well. But, okay, thanks. <laughs> that went on longer than I thought. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let's also, let me respond to Brother Hendricks here. He made a comment. He says, very important. Verse 9, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, not in the flesh, uh, Hendrix says, not in the flesh. So serving uh, with my Amen. Sp spirit. Yeah, uh, we really, we anything we do in the flesh, uh, I, I don't have any confidence in anybody's ability to do anything that God will value if it's done in the flesh. Uh, and let me see. Okay. Um, I'll go on to verse 10, 11, and 12 and read that if we can. It says, um, I put it here in the our chat area, Brother Cripps. It says, making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Brother Amen. Cripps, you want to go first on this one? Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so first of all, the first part, uh, making request, if by any means now the length might have a prosperous journey by the will of God. This is beautiful. So he's just praying for the journey that God would provide a way for them for him to uh, be with them and uh, notice, notice how he, he gives everything to God, you know, knowing that God is, is completely in charge. He is absolutely sovereign. So, uh, you know, when we make our request before the Lord and part of that is being grateful and part of that is asking for um, uh, his prosperity and especially uh, not in, <laughs> you gotta be careful, I guess, throwing that word around. Not, not that uh, prosperity means that uh, you're all gonna have mansions and, and yachts and uh, planes, but pro prosperous in the way that uh, his journey would be, um, you know, not wrought with, uh, with uh, bad circumstance. So uh, then 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, you may be established. Um, 
this is this is where uh, Paul relies on the Holy Spirit. That uh, everywhere he goes, the Holy Spirit speaks through him, and that's very clear. So he's uh, agreeing with the Holy Spirit b beforehand, even uh, expecting that uh, that the Holy Spirit will grant the spiritual gift that helps establish, in other words, confirm and hold up uh, the people that he's speaking to. So verse 11 is also great. And then number 12, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both you and me. And this is what I have the most to say about verse 12. Uh, this is this is key here because what I want people to know, and this is something I, I have been learning my whole life, but now is, is kind of really, really... Uh, he's he's driving the point home to me that we we gain comfort from each other you know yes of course the holy spirit comforts us and yes of course reading his word comforts us but the way that god set it up in relationships and the why we're supposed to not forsake the gathering together with other believers and that does not mean by the way a brick and mortar church what we're doing right now is church ecclesia that's what we're doing right now uh, you know, Brother Luke named this uh, church the Eternally Secure. It is, it is a, a church. And, that it, you know, if two or more people are gathered together in this place, and there's a lot more than that, if you include those in the chat room, then that's indeed what this is. And I'm in awe at the way that people share with each other, even the chat room. I know that sometimes people have their side conversations that, you know, that can be frustrating sometimes. But you have to understand that sometimes people just need a little bit of fellowship until they get to the point where they're able to accept more. And then there are other people in the chat room that just keep talking about God and they're paying attention to the uh, what's being said. And, uh, you know, people notice that. You know, sometimes people just need someone, needs to know that someone's there for them. You know, because, again, in this broken, fallen world, it's easy to think that, uh, that you're isolated and alone. And it's a horrible feeling to do, uh, to have, excuse me. So the point I want to make last uh, is that the mutual faith mutual faith so that applies to everyone that has faith the, you know true faith everyone that uh stands in agreement on these points and uh if you have mutual faith that is where you gain comfort from again not just from the holy spirit i mean yes you do and also from his word yes you do but he wants us to treat each other like family he wants us to love each other and lift each other up and encourage each other a lot of people are alone. They don't have someone. Uh, you know, they don't have someone to talk to. So I'm just happy in all these rooms that, that we have in, in this network of, of people, and especially in this one as well, that uh, people actually take the time out of their, uh, out of their day or their evening, uh, wherever you are, um, to fellowship with each other, honestly, to talk about whatever's on your mind. And uh, it, it just blows my mind continually. Praise God. Okay, Brother Steve. Which verses are we looking at? Uh, I'll read it again for you since you don't have it in front of I me. Have it. I, I have it. I have it in front of me. 10, 11, and 12. If, if, 10, 10, 11, and 12? Yeah. Okay. Making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Um, it seems to me he's showing two things in this verse that as it follows from verse 9, that he ceases, he, he, he doesn't cease in making mention of them always in his prayers and making requests. And that his request is to is to be with them um, and have a a prosperous journey. The journey being prosperous would mean that he actually gets there. That would be a prosperous journey. Um, you know, uh, in 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 my work, I'll have a prosperous journey tomorrow when I after I deliver. The load I, I'm I'm carrying right now, and and then when I make it home tomorrow, I will have had a prosperous journey because I I made it to where I wanted to go. Um, and verse eleven, for I long to see you 
that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Um, obviously, he's showing his care here for them and that, you know, he wants to help them grow in their walk with God, just like any any pastor or preacher today, if they're if they're worth their salt, if they're a true believer, and they then they hold their their uh, position uh, as e extremely important, which it is, especially to those who are babes in Christ, and just the same as those who are uh, who have been walking with God for years. You know the the position of a of a spiritual leader. Uh, or you know a pastor or something like that is extremely important and should be desiring to to help you grow in your walk and i think that's clear that that's what paul wants to do um and then verse 12 that is that i may be com that i may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me i think jason touched on it um earlier you know with with the gathering together and and that you know church is the body of christ church isn't you know you can have a quote-unquote church building with uh a bunch of people in it that doesn't make it the church especially if all those people are mostly non-believers because they don't even know what the real gospel is and i think that's sadly the case nowadays um but when you do have true brothers and sisters gathered together, our mutual faith should be beneficial to each other. We should help each other grow when we gather together. And that's the whole point of the verse that is so misused. The verse that says, do not forsake the fellowshipping of the saints that so many pastors use to guilt trip you into coming to church. Well, I can fellowship with two or three brothers and sisters like I am now with two brothers through the internet and my my our mutual faith is is being grown and comforted together. Boom. Uh, uh verse uh, are we doing verse 13 too? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I need I need to turn on uh, 10, 11, 12, then we'll go to 13. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. As long as we skip your turn. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to say that um, on verse uh, 10, we had a thought from uh, Hendricks that brings to mind, uh, I think it is an important thought he, he made there, that, uh, oh, let me see if I can, oh yeah, I, I copied it here. It says, uh, Paul has been begging God for a long while by this point for letting him go to Rome. God's denied him plenty of times before, but now God is sending him to Rome. Uh, that, that is a, actually a very important point, and it's, it's a very, uh, very significant point. There's a lot said about this, Paul's desire to go to Rome, Paul's determination to go to Rome, Paul being warned by a, a prophet, don't go to Rome because you'll, your hands will be tied together and others you'll become a prisoner. And, and uh, But Paul goes anyway, even though he was warned by a prophet to not go. And we know that when he finally did get to Rome, he never left Rome, did he? Uh, that was his, his, his uh, last place he ever went. So... Um, he wanted to get there so badly. Uh, uh, the um, it says, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Uh, yeah, it's just he really desired to go to Rome. Uh, Maybe there were even more letters written to Rome that we don't know about. I'm sure there's there's a lot of uh, things that were written among uh, from apostles to the church that were not uh, saved, unfortunately. Thankfully, we have this book of Romans. Uh, it says, for I, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. I wonder what spiritual gift, if he had any particular thing in mind, 
uh, to the end you may be established. And we, um, uh, I think it's in Corinthians, maybe Second Corinthians, uh, uh, where, where Paul was talking about the spiritual gifts and the different parts of the body and the different gifts, and that some gifts would cease at some point. And I do think that the gift of healing ceased. We know Paul was no longer able to heal uh, when by the time he wrote the letter to Timothy, uh, because Timothy was sick and Paul couldn't help him except to offer him, tell him to drink wine for his stomach. So uh, in this case, uh, he had some spiritual gift or maybe a collection or a variety of gifts for everybody. He, want, he wanted them to receive their gifts. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the Bible tell, does tell us that we all have a spiritual gift, at least eight, maybe more than one. And this, to me, the saddest thing is if a person doesn't ever learn what their gift is, and it's even worse if they learn what their gift is and then they don't work at it. So I think that's a, that's a worthy prayer for uh, if you're not sure what God wants you to do. Um, you know, I, I had I was talking to Brother Chase uh, in our private chat room or private uh, fellowship room. If, if you haven't been in there, by the way, I, I really recommend everybody uh, let Matthias know you want to be on the list to get the link every day and join us uh, from 6 p.m. Um, Eastern time onward. Uh, we're in there uh, having fellowship with each other. It's, it's not any like a teaching or like we're doing now. It's just just casual and it's great company. Um, but uh, Brother Chase, his profession is sales. And I spent many years in sales and, and I did a lot of public speaking. And when I was decided I needed to get to work for the Lord, uh, I wanted to be a minister of some kind. Of some kind uh, I, I knew right away that I'm the mouth. I've, 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 I've talked to, I've given thousands of speeches to the public, you know, all sizes of audiences, thousands of people in the audience, did small audiences. I was very experienced, I was very skillful at, at giving a speech. And I thought, and I did that for money. <laughs> so uh, I, I've got a gift. That's the gift I can use for the Lord to be the mouth and tell people the good news. And I've been doing it, you know, as much as I could since then. So I, if you don't know what your gift is, that would be a very a fervent prayer I would recommend for everybody. Keep praying, Lord, tell me what my gift is. And, and once it's revealed to you, Lord, strengthen me to empower me, filling you with the Holy Spirit, by the way. Uh, not everybody agrees with this interpretation, but we got the baptism of the Spirit is when we first believe and the Spirit enters us uh, and, and we're brought to life spiritually. The indwelling is the promise that is, it will never leave us. It will indwell us permanently. And the sealing means that we're sealed and uh, it's permanent. But the filling is something that's Old Testament and New Testament. They never got baptized or sealed with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Even before the death, burial, and resurrection, before Pentecost, Jesus breathed it into their mouths and they were filled with the Spirit that he gave them the Spirit temporarily so they'd be empowered to do, go out and do miracles. But that was temporary. They didn't have, weren't sealed as the way we are. But uh, but now we're, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but you can still pray, Lord, fill me with the Spirit, empower me, and give the Holy Spirit, strengthen me and direct me into ministry work. So I think as far as he's continuing to pray, um, and then verse 12, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That is a great comfort. One of the most comforting things in my life is this mutual faith that I have with here is Brother Steve, Brother Cripps, uh, everybody else, everybody in the fellowship room, everybody I've gotten to know here, knowing that I'm not a believer all alone. That's so comforting. And uh, Paul also said that we should prefer the company of believers. We should not withdraw and become monks, you know, just stay with fellow believers and no one else. We, we want our light to shine to the world, be a witness for Jesus. But at the same time, our preference should always be 
I desire to be with a believer. I, I want to be with someone who always wants to talk about Jesus. If I'm with someone and they say, oh, well, can't you change the subject? You have to talk about Jesus all the time. <laughs> you know, no, I'd rather be with you, Brother Cripps. Steve, you're never going to say, hey, can you talk about something else? Okay, over to you. I might. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, not not on this show. You know, the different different uh, channels have uh, different um, uh, kind of ways that they go about things. You know, TSL does have a, definitely has a, a biblical uh, background behind it, but um, it, it's it's not necessarily a Bible study. Yours is about is literally a Bible study, and I've made this this point on there, and this is the perfect example of that. That's why I refer people to your channel. Um, yeah, it, absolutely, I agree with everything you said, and. Um, I, I just continue to impress upon people the idea that uh, praying for each other is so important and also um, encouragement. People need encouragement. That's absolutely necessary. Okay, so you read 12. You just read 13, so that's what I'm commenting on now. I would not uh, have you. No, no, no I, um, I haven't read 13. I, okay. I just, we've all talked about 10, 11, and 12. Right. And going to 13. So why don't you go ahead and read it and talk about it and then that's Stephen and then me. I, sh I sure will. So uh, uh, verse 13 reads, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hear the hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. This is beautiful. This is uh, to me. This is where Paul is saying that he even is edified by everything that they have to offer. And again, I would go back up to where he says in uh, in verse uh, twelve, mutual faith, both of you and me, uh, both you and me. He also makes the point here about Gentiles, even as among other Gentiles. So he's uh, again, he's including uh, both Jew and Gentile, as you as we read in the dramatic reading. It's not a separation of the two, uh, and, and I, and I, with all the other um, uh, people out there that want to just uh, isolate themselves, uh, Hebrew rooters and whatnot, um, not just them. There's a lot of them out there. Um, it's very important to remember that uh, under Christ we are all the same. We are brothers and sisters under Him. Uh, he is the head. Jesus is the cornerstone of uh, the Christian life. And that if everything is uh, based and and uh, and seated in Him, then uh, we are brothers and sisters in Him indeed. Steve. Yeah, um, I, I did want to make one point. I think you kind of touched on it, uh, Brother Luke, on verse eleven. You know, you're talking about the spiritual gifts and how Paul said, you know, he wants to impart some kind of spiritual gift. And, you know, um, like with what Jason was saying, comfort and edification and encouragement <clears throat> would be uh, imparting a spiritual gift, the, you know, to, to help someone grow in their understanding of Scripture would be to help someone. It, it would be giving them a spiritual gift. Um, so I don't know if he was necessarily talking about spiritual gifts, but I, I agree with uh, with a lot of what you said there, and uh, I, I'm dare say I'm I'm a little bit different on uh, viewpoint on on those things that I don't think they have ceased, but um, I think it's all from the Holy Spirit and through God, and uh, even if someone has the gift of of healing, it's as God wills it, and I don't think it, it has ever been a magic. Um, like a magic wand um you know like paul asked three times for uh the thorn in his side to be taken away and god said no my grace is sufficient and um you know for anybody uh, I, i've seen a few people in the chat room that are struggling with things and i would say you know uh his grace is sufficient for no matter what you're going through or struggling with um and that uh, God's more concerned about your relationship with him than the, the sin or the struggles that you're, you're dealing with. And just, you know, focus on your relationship with him and let him help you grow and 
in your walk so that, you know, as you as you just focus on Jesus, the things of this world will fall away on their own um, instead of just struggling to try to stop doing things out of your own power by walking with God closer and closer and letting the Holy Spirit dwell in you uh, or, you know, grow in power in you more and more as you walk with him. You know, um, I think you'll see some of those things just fall away easier instead of trying to do it on your own power. And verse 13, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So I see... <clears throat> him you know here just saying hey look i've i've been i've been trying to get get to you and i don't want you to be you know ignorant of things and i i want to have some <clears throat> some fruit in our conversation and in in my leading you i want to be there to help grow your fruit uh even as i'm doing with other other uh gentiles and in places that i'm helping so like you know it's it's kind of like you guys aren't the only ones who i'm trying to help but at the same time i want to be with every every single group that i that i'm going to to going and trying to help them grow and i want to help you grow and i wish i could be in all these places at once that's kind of how i uh see this verse um did we just do 13 or uh should I do 14, 15 or no? Uh, no, uh, 13 is the last verse we're going to do uh, because uh, we started with verse 14 tonight. And last week we did one through seven. So we needed to get those those verses that we skipped over. We covered those now. Um, anything more to say about 13, uh, Brother Steve? No, I think I covered. I think I covered everything that I wanted to say there. All right, let me talk about thirteen then. Uh, um, many of you know that I have. Uh, I've been saved thirty-two years, and for the first twenty-five years, really, I was a strict KJV only person, and uh, and then I later changed my mind and said. KJV first. I rely on the KJV. I consider it the scriptures, but I like to look at other translations. Sometimes it can be helpful to me. Uh, so for those of you who are KJV only, I praise you. That's fine with me. Uh, but I hope you don't try to impose that on everybody else. <clears throat> but uh, I like looking at the Amplified a lot of times because it amplifies. And that's what we're doing. The Amplified does it in, in print. And we're doing it verbally. We're amplifying our thoughts about the verse. Um, so I'll read it in the Amplified. And it says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters. Now, first of all, in the KGB, it says brethren. I recently started using uh, brethren. And if, if there's a sister, I call it sistren. Now, it's probably not a word. I don't think there is a word sistren. <laughs> but... Uh, brethren just means uh, everybody who's a believer, whether whether it's a male or female. It's uh, uh, it's like mankind. Some some uh, some women are offended because it's it, mankind uh, is favors man over women, I guess. So, but uh, it, it just means humanity, all, all people, and, and brethren means all believers. But uh, in this case, they make the point to say, "Hey, sisters are included, brothers and sisters, everybody." It's, uh, it's not a, uh, now I love the verses where it says there's no difference between Jew and Greek, male and female, uh, 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 on and on. Whatever. I don't remember the, everything in it, but uh, I, I, to me, that's one of the most important parts of, of Scripture, to, to let everybody know that, look, God's not discriminated against us because of our race or our culture or, or our, our gender. Uh, we're all equal in God's eyes regarding uh, being a child of God. So it says, uh, brothers and sisters, that many times I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. So in the, in the Amplified, it goes a little bit further making that point that I was making. 
that Paul had been planning and trying and desiring to go to Rome for a long time and insisting upon it, even though he was warned by a prophet, don't go, it'll be the end of you. And uh, he, he didn't care. He didn't care if it was the end of him. He felt it was so important for him to go there, um, probably realizing that he, you know, by going there, he would be a martyr. Uh, he also knew that God was in charge. Paul was totally trusting God. So it's not that he didn't listen to what other people said, but ultimately God's the one that makes the decision in our lives. Even if everyone stands against us, if we feel from God that we're supposed to do something, you better obey. You know, he, he might have something for you when other people don't see, even if you're, you know, you might uh, feel like you may be in danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that particular part of scripture, though, um, I'm not sure how to take it because um, the person who told Paul uh, that God told him to tell him that don't go there, you'll be tied up. And, you know, he didn't go into great detail, but, you know, he gave him a warning and he said it came from God and it turned out to be true. So it was a revelation from God. So the question is, uh, did he just defy what God wanted him to do? Um, or, or was it more like you said, in spite of the fact that that he was warned and, and God was telling him that it'll be the end of you? It, was it, it wasn't really defying God. It was just he knew he had to go anyway, even though it was going to cost him his life. I'm not really sure how to take that. Well, for sure. I didn't mean he was denying God. No, I, that's not at all what I said. Uh uh, I, I, I just mean that uh, God should be the one that leads you and not just men. Uh, we are there's, uh, in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. So we definitely gain wisdom by other people's opinions. But I, all I'm saying is when it comes down to it, if God is telling you to do something, you're pretty sure yeah. and you do it. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, implying that you said he was denying God. Oh, I, was, I, know. I was saying that I was insinuating that okay. he was defying God. Sure, sure. I understand that. I'm not sure how to take that. It, it seems to me that he got a clear warning from a prophet, and prophet said, God told me to tell you, don't go there. So uh, it's my opinion that perhaps he was defying God's will, hmm. uh, but I don't know. I yeah, don't. I'm not sure. Um, um, I, I do want to uh, say something about the versions when you when you get a chance. So let me uh, know when I can do that. And I, and in the middle of the verse, so uh, uh, after I'm finished with this, I'm only halfway through this verse. Uh, he says, um, and I've been prevented so far so that I may have some fruit of my labors among you. Some fruit of my labors. Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the fruit of his labors would just be uh, from faith to faith. You know, this the saying that we're, we, we're uh, I forget exactly how it's phrased, but it says from faith to faith. One person's faith generates another believer and that believer generates another believer by our testimony. Uh, and uh, so that's probably the fruit. The fruit is just more believers. Uh, my labor's among you, even as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. Uh, so I think he's talking about, uh, I want fruit among you. I want you to grow as a church because of my other churches, they've all been growing. I'd like to see you grow too. Okay, go ahead, Brother Cripps. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what you were saying. Um, I, I grew up in, with the King James Version and also with uh, doing plays and stuff like that, did a lot of Shakespeare and it was really easy for me because I started at a really early age to continue to understand uh, KGB the way that the wording is done because, you know, we don't talk like that anymore. So uh, Jen brought up in the chat about, you know, be, it being okay uh, to look at other versions if we don't fully understand the King James Version. And then uh, then you come uh, behind that and you uh, make it clear that you started out with uh, KGB onlyism. And uh, the, God kind of uh, showed you something else. And I just wanted to add to that. I think that's a brilliant uh, response um, that God works through everything. He has the power to supersede Satan's twisting of what Jesus uh, already created. And that includes the Bible verses that people rail against all the other Bible verses or, vi or versions, excuse me. 
and say, oh, they took this out or they did this or they twisted this or they changed this word around. And yes, that does happen. Uh, you, you must be, uh, definitely use discernment in choosing which particular version uh, that you're learning from. But even with the versions, uh, versions of scripture that things are taken out of it, a person can still see God. God's word, nothing can stand against his word. His word will uh, remain forever. That's made very clear in scripture. Um, he even uses secular things to reach people. I mean, you know, that's uh, extra biblical, but I'm just saying that uh, some things he, he teaches us and some things are common sense. And that certainly to me is, is something that I've learned. Um, so yeah, there are people out there that only look at KGV. That's great. Um, I look at a couple different versions, as you said, uh, Brother Luke. And for me, it's just a richer study. You know, you, you uh, take a passage from the KGV and uh, one from the Amplified or whatever uh, your choice might be. And uh, it just puts it in a different uh, uh, setting for you to understand better from different perspectives. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, pretty much um, uh, the, most of the people who are really active in our fellowship uh, are either KJV only, or I, I call it KJV first, Renee calls it KJV preferred. So we all either use it exclusively or lean towards it. But what I object to is just someone telling other people what Bible translation they have to use. I mean, if someone want, else wants to be strict about it and say, I'm KJV only, good for you. I don't mind. Good for you indeed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Brother Steve, you are gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I, I, I concur with, with both of you on what you're saying. And, um, I, I love this saying, truth is truth, no matter where you find it, if it's God's truth, you know, um, and, and that goes with the Bible that goes with, with music that goes with movies that goes with nature you know, anything and everything in life, if God's truth is present there, which I believe God's truth is present in just about everything, that, you know, God is not limited to just the scriptures that we have in print to be able to reach someone that's looking for him, that's seeking him. And I, I think that, uh, you know, the... The gospel is in places that we wouldn't even believe if if we if we thought about it, and I'd say especially for those who are against the gospel and against things like that would uh, you know not see it there. But I mean, I could give examples, but um, like. <laughs> I'll probably put myself under attack for saying this, but I can I can see the gospel in uh, it, I I can show someone the gospel from part of the 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 last Harry Potter book, and I can show it how you know if you put Jesus in the place of this person and the devil in the place of this person and how you know. Just like, you know, and I, I, I could I could do it, you know, and I think, you know, so much in life as as a believer, we we seem, especially nowadays, we seem to look for the negative in the world. And look for oh all the wrong things that are going on with this, that and the other, maybe just maybe. We should start looking for the truth of God and things instead of just trying to find the enemy's junk in in the world. And one thing I, I uh, was listening to a podcast of, by a guy named Pastor, Pastor Bob, his channel's Pastor Bob Beeman. One of the things he said is, you know, as believers, you know, maybe we should actually take the time to listen to the world to be, so we can read between the lines to be able to see the pain that people are in and then can thereby shed the light of the love of Christ into their lives where 
it would actually do some real good, you know, um, because so oftentimes things in, you know, the things that the world does, a lot of the times, you know, people call it, you know, that's, that's witchcraft or satanic or whatever. A lot of times in that stuff is a cry for help. And are we not the body of Christ? Is not the blood of Christ, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit living in us, more powerful than any satanic crap that the world could dish at, out at us? Do we not have the power of God, the gospel, to to fight back against it with, but still in love? I mean, why are we so worried about what the world is doing when the world is going to be the world? We are the ambassadors of Christ. Let's take the light and the love of Christ and shine it into the world. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to actually understand where people are coming from. So thanks. That might have been way off, off subject, but <laughs> thank you. Yay. Yes, yeah, yay. Yeah. Uh, that was Stephen the preacher. It wasn't off. <laughs> awesome. You tied it all well, in well, you. praise God. Uh, the, yeah, it wasn't off topic, brother. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, praise God. Uh, I, I want to kind of sum up uh, things. Uh, we uh, we started a uh, half hour earlier than our normal start time. Uh, since Sister Renee was not going to be available, uh, I, I usually start at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, so she has time to get home from church and join us. Um, we didn't have that uh, uh, to consider tonight. So we started a little bit earlier. I thought that maybe we need a little bit more time tonight to get through this and still end by 11 p.m. Eastern. So uh, we need to uh, sum things up now. Uh, let, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps first uh, uh, to take some time to sum up your thoughts on the study as a whole tonight. Uh, certainly. I I. I... I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, uh, the biggest thing uh, that I think that I want to portray to everyone is um, just just keep turning to God. I, I, I mean, whatever your situation is, uh, it, again, and I've, this is probably the third time I've said this tonight, uh, but we live in a, in a dark world. And um, the other thing I want to add is that uh, God is the creator. Satan can only twist things. So that means that everything we see, all the beauty of nature, every every rock, every tree, all the beautiful rivers, the air, um, every uh, creature, every bird, they were all created. Music doesn't come from Lucifer. Okay, it doesn't come from him. Yes, he had the ability of of music. Who created music? Did Satan create it? No. The ability to write something, the the ability to um, to uh, make a movie or write a script or any of that. Are any gifts from, from Satan? No, all Satan can do is twist things. So um, uh, getting, getting back to the passage, I think it was a, a great take in introducing the idea. And uh, the dramatic reading really, really came across, at least for me, even uh, in doing it myself and being a part of it. Um, the bottom line of it is, is that uh, interpretation is uh, very important. And uh, for a new believer, a technique like that would certainly be beneficial to help them understand. Uh, someone in the uh, chat room made the comment that uh, in that verse, it wasn't about, uh, you know, nothing in that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but nothing in that verse was from a, a false teacher. And um, I understand where you're coming from, but the, the bottom line of it is, is uh, no, Paul wasn't a false teacher. He was presenting arguments in a dramatic way to to show people the contrast of these different ideas, and uh, that's exactly what we attempted to do here tonight. So uh, none of us are implying in any way that uh, Paul uh, was uh, representative of a false teacher. He, he isn't a false teacher. He was given um, given the gospel on the road to Damascus directly from uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, he uh, ran a good race. And uh, he stands among all the other writers of Scripture as, as, as probably the one that was given the keys uh, to the gospel itself. He's not to be lifted higher than any, any uh, lifted higher than God, obviously, as some people seem to seem to think, or even list, uh, lifted higher than Christ. 
uh, but he is definitely instrumental in uh, understanding salvation more, especially after the resurrection. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I hope that tied in okay, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Brother Steve, uh, sum up your thoughts for us, please. Um, I, I think it was a really <clears throat> eye-opening uh, Bible study today, especially the, the uh, prosopopoeia. Um, you know, it, it's always good to, like, like you say, brother Luke, Luke, to to listen to to new ideas or, or things in in studying the scripture. You know, to always be willing and open to learn God's truth and um. Uh, the way that the passage was read by the two of you was just, you know, mind blowing to me. Um, and I think it was wonderful. Um, and I, 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 for me, I think one of the biggest things that I, I took, you know, from it tonight, besides the, besides that, um, was, you know, verse nine to in chapter one. Um, or verse eight, you know, that I want to have that kind of witness, um, uh, of other people that, you know, not for me, but for them, that they see the light of Christ in me. And that that's what I want to do. You know, I, I want people to see that I want, you know, no matter who you are, where you are, what you're going through, or, or where you're coming from, that in some way you experience the love of Christ through me. And if I can do that, it's been a good day. Um, and uh, with with the other stuff, with, with the Bible translations, look, if you can only get your hands on on an NIV or even a, you know, living Bible or or whatever it what matters is asking god to to give you the correct interpretation asking god to give you the understanding you know asking god to guide you a, into all truth and you know the other things we talked about like prayer and and conversation with god you know that's a two-way street you know, uh, be a good listener and try to listen for what God is, is telling you, especially as you're reading the scriptures, you know, um, having a King James is great, but if you don't have a King James and you have another, another Bible, read it. God is more powerful than anything Satan can try to do to twist the truth, or anything, you know, uh, God is more powerful than a movie writer that, that, or a songwriter that thinks he's, he's, uh, you know, writing something for his own purposes or nefarious purposes. God is still more powerful than them. Even their intention, God is more powerful than. So, you know, always be aware and looking for, you know, God's truth especially in scripture and, and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you as you do that. And as you walk through life, I think those are important things. Um, so, and of course, praying for each other, um, you know, uh, solid and, you know, good interpretation of scripture always involves, you know, things like we talked about knowing who the author is, what is his intent towards the audience, what what's, you know, his main purpose for the letter, who's the people he's writing to, what time period is it is it in, what's going on during that time, um, and always reading scripture in context and never taking one verse out 
to try to make some point it has to jive with the context of of the letter of the passage and of the entire scriptures itself if if it doesn't line up with the rest of scripture then you know uh these are all just good solid bible study teachings to help you grow as you learn and study so i mean you know and one thing to note with that when these were written there were never chapter numbers and there were never <clears throat> uh there are never verse numbers and so it's a good idea if you have the time when you read things like this to try to read them as if you're reading a letter from someone and read them you know don't don't just read chapter one and stop if if you can M make sure you understand how chapter one flows into chapter two and how chapter two flows into chapter three stuff like that but um you know because we were talking part of the reason i brought all that up is because you know we're looking at a, a different way to look at the scriptures and i think it's a really great way especially to help you know, babes in Christ understand what Paul is getting at. Um, Cause I do see that he does even before today, he does put in, you know, how the, how the, you know, the world is saying this or perhaps false teachers are saying this, but this is what Jesus is saying. And you can always be looking for what Paul is trying to say in context with, with, you know, the chapters to even some of his other writings, you know, that they match up. If you if you learn how they match up, all of scripture matches up. And I guess that's my final point. And you can do that with other versions too, if you can't get your hands on a King James. So thanks for letting me blah 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 blah. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me on, Brother Luke. I appreciate it very much. Praise God for, I think, a wonderful Bible study. Um, and you're an awesome man of God. I love you. And I love you too, Jason. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Steve. If, if you love me, call me, Steve. Call me. Okay, you're Steve. Likewise. <laughs> That, that conversation goes two ways, buddy. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just joking. I, I, I've been wrapped up in a lot of stuff lately, good stuff, all of it good, but uh, definitely lately, yeah, no problem. He said, he said, if you love me, call me Steve, so I called him, okay, you're Steve. Yeah, don't try to, <laughs> don't, don't try to ruin our moment. You can manipulate the English yeah. language like that? Okay. I love it. Okay, guys. Can all I right, Steve, can I, I love you. Help? I'd like to you know, I like to sum up the study and my my how I see it now. Um, for, first of all, uh, we started off t tonight telling everybody that Sister Renee would not be here, and if you're if you weren't here in the beginning to to learn about that, I want everybody to know that uh, Renee tried to do some plumbing work, you know, and in her in her uh, the way her uh, life and finances are uh, right now, you know, sometimes. She has to try to do something herself, and she's not able, and she ends up hurting her hip. So she's injured and in pain, so pray for her. Um, the other thing, of course, um, um, Brother Steve uh, was uh, available to, to join me tonight, and that oh, was a great blessing. I appreciate you being available and uh, joining us and, and contributing to the conversation. And in uh, uh, the very, very end, when I saw you smiling, um, I I'm just... Anytime someone smiles at me, I feel like they're giving me a gift and you have a good smile and you use it. So thank you. Um, Do you hear the smile in my voice? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can hear can it. Can you hear it? Good. Very good. You it's nice there. In your <laughs> um, now, regarding the subject matter, uh, first of all, I know that there are some people who joined this um, live stream late and if you joined this after we did our uh dramatic uh presentation uh you you really missed out on the whole point of tonight 
And I, I hope that you will go and watch this on the playback from the beginning, because I think the point that we made uh, is an important point. It's a point that's, uh, uh, let's say it's, um, it's different, but it's also uh, almost an unknown way of looking at the scriptures. Uh, chances are you've never heard of this way of, of looking at this uh, portion of scriptures. You've never heard of this before. It's called prosopopoeia. Uh, I have a, a playlist uh, that goes into detail about this called Was Paul a Diatribalist Prosopopoeia? <clears throat> and in that playlist, I explain it even in more detail, but I attempt to do what uh, I believe Paul asked Phoebe to do. Paul asked Phoebe to go to Rome, take this letter and read it and read it in this way. Read it so that they know the parts that are from me and the parts that are from the false teacher. And and uh, and that's what I did in, in my original playlist. But I think that what we did tonight was an improvement upon that. Uh, with Brother Cripps' help, we were able to play the part of Paul and the false teacher so you could and you could see how these verses could easily be understood that way. In fact, I believe that's the only way it really makes perfect sense. So if you joined us late, I urge you to go watch it from the beginning and please make a comment on the video and let us know if you think that this makes sense. Uh, and then as you continue reading Paul's letters, keep this in the back of your mind because perhaps he used prosopopoeia in other places too. Um, uh, other than that, I, I just put up, I want to promote the, uh, the, the, the private fellowship room that Matthias started last week. Uh, uh, it, it begins at uh, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. If you want to be part of it, contact Matthias on his email and ask him to send you the link every day. And you just click on the link and we're all talking together and visiting and having fellowship. It's been a great blessing to me. I'm in there. I've been in there every day since since he started it. And there's about maybe five or six people that are there a lot and five or 10 other people that come in part of the time. But we're having great fellowship. And I urge everybody to participate in that. And I, you will be blessed. I will be blessed if you if you join us. Um, OK, so uh, other than that, I guess that uh, uh, there's nothing else left to be said except uh, please Please uh, join us every Wednesday at uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time for the Wednesday Night Bible Study. And join us every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time for the uh, Sunday broadcast for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And uh, Brother Cripps, thank you for helping out tonight. You did a great job uh, in your dramatic reading playing Paul. Thank you so much. And uh, Brother Steve, again, thanks, thanks again. To, to all the viewers, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.